Hi everybody, this is a revision video for the inferential statistics part of the AQA Psychology Year 2 specification. I'm going to cover some of the bullet points on the specification and some prior knowledge is assumed here, uh, in particular reference to just what's on the slide, which is the seventh bullet point of the data handling and analysis section, uh, which is the levels of measurement. Um, so if this is something you're not familiar with, I suggest you do a quick bit of cramming before watching this video. The second part of the specification where this video is relevant, perhaps really relevant, is the inferential testing section as listed above. Um, and indeed what I hope to cover in this video is kind of all of this content but in a very, very revision format style. The main thing to be aware of is the amount of tests you have to um, know for the exam and there's eight statistical tests and I've just given you the names here. Uh, perhaps post the most important thing to be aware of to begin with is that you only actually have to know how to calculate the sign test. What you do need to know however with all of the tests is when to use them and also how to check if the result is significant using a table of critical values. Also added to that, you're going to perhaps be required to comment on whether a type 1 or type 2 error is more likely given the results. Now the first thing that we'll start with then is how to pick the right statistical test. So let's take this research scenario as an example of the type of question that will assess your ability to select the right test based on a description of research like the one on the slide here. Now there's a number of relatively easy to remember steps to get you to the right test. Uh, eventually you might represent these as some kind of table or diagram form, but essentially it just boils down to three main questions. The first question is what is the research looking for? Is it looking for a difference or a correlation? Um, so correlation type questions tend to maybe use the word relationship in them. Difference questions might refer to performance in some particular test before and after. Are you looking for a difference between these two time points? Uh, the second question is one of research design. Um, so your design will either be repeated measures, match pairs or independent groups. If it's repeated measures or match pairs, we'd refer to this as a related design and independent groups would refer to it as unrelated. Final question, which is the real big one, because it's one that tends to be a real problem area for many students, is what is the level of measurement? Um, one bit of advice I'd give you with this is you're trying to figure out what variable you're looking at for the level of measurement is in an experimental method focus on the DV and in a study of correlation look at the co-variables because it's the level of measurement for those that ultimately you're interested in. So remember there are eight tests that we need to know and here I've summarised where each would fall in respect to the answers given in terms of those three questions that we asked. Like I said, it's probably better to remember this in some kind of table or diagram flowchart form. Um, what you can see, in addition to those three questions, if you just look there, unrelated t-test, related t-test and also Pearson's, I've added on there that they're what we call parametric tests. Um, I wouldn't get overly concerned with what this term means, it's not named on the specification. Uh, in a nutshell, parametric tests basically make assumptions about a population's properties, um, for example, that the data is normally distributed. Knowing what we know now in terms of when to use each test, we're hopefully in a position to get it right. Uh, going back to the research scenario I showed you before, you can see that the researcher is looking for a difference, uh, not a correlation, a difference between the score in the positive and the negative condition. Uh, we can see that the same group of people are being used in both conditions, therefore a related design, i.e. repeated measures. And the final thing is the giving ratings of attractiveness as the dependent variable, and that's ordinal level data. And now, if we take a look at our eight tests again, in terms of where this would fit, hopefully you can spot there Wilcoxon. So Wilcoxon is a test for difference with ordinal data in a related design. Be very, very careful here though, because one mistake, uh, a classic mistake that students make, for example, is saying that the data was interval instead of ordinal. And if I picked out interval data for that particular research scenario, it would lead me to the related t-test, which is obviously the incorrect answer. 
And here's another example. Uh, again, the first question is, is it difference or correlation? Um, so this is a study of difference as it's looking in the change in political preference before and after being given information. Uh, it's the same group of people here before and after. So it's a related design, repeated measures. And finally, the DV in this case is nominal data, as in it's the political party favoured, which is, of course, categorical data. And here we are, back to the tests. So we've just got to find a test that matches these parameters. And there it is, bottom right, you should see the sign test, a test of difference with a related sample and nominal level data. OK, this brings us on to the second type of question, which is assessing if you're able to tell whether a given result by a particular test is significant or not. Um, here's some extra information that I've just added into the original research we looked at. Uh, you'll be see here that I've been told they used 10 participants, that their hypothesis was that participants would give higher ratings of attraction after hearing positive information compared to negative information. Hopefully you can spot that's a one-tailed directional hypothesis as opposed to a two-tailed non-directional hypothesis. I've also been told here that they want to use the 5% level of significance and that the observed value of t was 8. What that means is they ran their Wilcoxon calculation and the test statistic that they got was 8. So now I need to know whether or not this result is significant and in order to do that I have to look at something called a table of critical values. Here's our table of critical values and what they are is just preset values representing the cutoff boundary set for basically judging the significance of a result. Um, each test has its own critical values table, so the t-tests share one. They tend to look a bit different as well, I'll talk about these a bit later on in the video. Um, but what you do need to know is in the exam if you need a critical values table you'll be given the one that you need so don't panic about having to remember all of this. OK, back to our result. So our result has the observed value uh, for t of 8. Uh, what we need to do now is figure out what the relevant critical value is. So the information we need in order to be able to do this is whether our test uh, had a one or two-tailed hypothesis. Uh, so we were working, remember, with a one-tailed hypothesis. The level of significance that the psychologist wanted to use, which was 5% or 0.05 and how many were in our sample, so what n was equal to. So if we just look at our table here, and if we go um, from n across, and if we go level of significance, one tail test 0 0.5 and down, then hopefully we should be able to get to the right critical value. Now, where it intersects is shown here at the critical value of 11. So just to recap, n is 10, so go across from 10, level of significance for one tail test at the 0.05 level, go down and it gives me the critical value of 11. Now this is another point where we need to be very, very careful. If you'd incorrectly identified the hypothesis as a two-tailed, you'd actually pick out the critical value of 8, because you'd be on levels of significance for a two-tailed test, 0.05. So again, just a very basic thing like recognising the difference between a one-tailed and two-tailed hypothesis is absolutely critical. Now the next job then is to make a statement about whether or not this is a significant result. And in order to do this, you just need to remember one very important rule. That's the rule of greater. And it's a pretty straightforward rule. Um, basically, if the test name has the letter R in it, that's to say literally has the letter R, um, chi-squared, related t-test, unrelated t-test, Spearman's and Pearson's, then in order to say a result is significant, the observed value must be equal to or greater than the critical value. Without the letter R, Wilcoxon, Sign Test, Mann Whitney, the observed value must be equal to or lower than the critical value in order to be a significant result. So if you'll recall, we were using the Wilcoxon test. Wilcoxon does not have the letter R in it, which means in order to be significant, our observed value must be equal to or lower than our critical value. And you can see there, our observed value for t of 8 is lower than the critical value um, of 11 at the 5% level where n equals 10. So ultimately, the end result is to reject the null hypothesis. 
essentially I'm saying that I think I found something here. Now, what's there in the red box is quite important. If asked to comment on the significance of a result um, for more than um, one mark, it isn't good enough to say it was a significant result. You will have to make reference to the observed value, the critical value you found in the table. Um, if it's n, where the test uses n, and I'll talk about that in a second, and what n is, uh, and also the level of significance that you were using. Just want to pull out a key difference as well, just to be aware of in terms of using the different statistical tests. Of course, Wilcoxon that we've just looked at used the n value to navigate to the right critical value. Um, other tests, um, for example, chi squared uses df. Um, Man Whitney uses n1 and n2, um, numbering group one and numbering group two. On to the final question type that you can get, which is on type 1 and type 2 errors. Um, so just very briefly in terms of what they are, type 1 I like to refer to as call off the party. So a type 1 error happens when you have a significant result, so you've rejected your null hypothesis. Uh, the problem is, uh, with these type 1 errors, and they do tend to happen where your p-value is a little too lenient, so particularly at the 10% level, is there is still, at the 10% level, 10% chance that your results did actually occur through chance. So even a result that's significant uh, at the 5% level arguably has a 5% margin of error in terms of the result. So you may well actually have a non-significant result at a stricter level of significance. Type 2 errors occur in a non-significant result, um, and I like to call these start the party. So um, you may have done a piece of research and you've used, let's say, a 1% level. Maybe you've done a piece of drug testing, so you have to be really strict with your level of significance. And the outcome is that the result was not significant. However, let's remember at that 1% level, you've got 99% certainty of your results. So it may well have been the case that at more lenient levels of significance, you did in fact have a significant result. So let's just look at this with the result that we got in terms of Wilcoxon and think about the kind of error we might have made. Remember, the observed value of t um, was 8 and we had a critical value of 11 and it was a significant result at the 5% level. Now, because this was a significant result, the type of error that might have been made would be, of course, the type 1 error. And the way, basically, to check whether or not there was, in fact, a type 1 error is simply just to work across the columns of the table. So what I need to do is I need to work down to the critical value for 1%. So if we look here, the critical value at 1% is 5. Now, remember the rule for Wilcoxon, the observed value must be equal to or lower than the critical value. This means this result is no longer significant, which may well indicate a type 1 error. Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments section and I'll try and get around to answering them. Um, and don't forget to watch the rest of our videos on the site and subscribe for any upcoming videos.